You know, all of us were talking in between these sessions of uh, when I was a baby Christian, I wish I had the understanding of the first two lessons. Yeah. You, you have no idea how many days I just was almost crying and shouting or whatever my emotions were. God, what have I done? Why? Where is your presence? And, you know, if you look at Jesus, he's the best example. I mean, here's Jesus, right? And the masses, I mean, they all came out from Judea and Jerusalem to hear John the Baptist. The masses are out in the wilderness, right? Jesus comes out, gets baptized. The heavens open up. The Holy Spirit descends in bodily form. Okay, like a dove. So he comes upon Jesus and God the Father speaks. This is my beloved son yeah. in whom I'm well pleased. Man, here's what we would do in America because we're so, uh, such good op- entrepreneurs. Oh my gosh, God just announced I'm his choice child, right? In front of all the masses. Get on social media. Everybody go to Insta Story right now, okay? I'm starting my ministry. The first meeting's gonna be in Jerusalem, right? But what happens? The very next verse, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit was led by the Spirit. So it wasn't the devil who led him there. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days of the devil. There was a reason. And I'm going to show you that reason later. So I want to talk in this lesson about the process of a promise. Okay? The process of a promise. First of all, let me, just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me define the word process. Process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end goal, right? So we're going to talk about the process of a promise, all right? Now, if we look at this, let's talk about the way God works in our lives. First of all, he gives us a promise. He does this with all of his kids. Every, if I sit down with any believer, true believer, that has a relationship with the Lord, and I say, tell me, what are some of the things God's put you in your heart? They can go back and say, man, when I was a young believer, when I was, a, uh, uh, when I was you know, been walking with the Lord for three years, four years, and I was really seeking, and God showed me I'd do this and do that or whatever, right? He'll give it. What does that promise do when God gives it to us? It awakens destiny, yeah. all right? Remember, he predestined us. Don't get nervous with that word. I'll talk about it later, okay, in another lesson. But it awakens our destiny. So then you got to go through the process. That's when the process begins. God gives the promise, and then the process begins, okay? What is the process? It is the development of the needed faith and the needed character to fulfill the promise. So in other words, when the promise is given, we don't have the character or the faith to fulfill it, okay? And then the third step is the promises fulfilled. So let me use Joseph as an example, right? God gives Joseph a dream, two dreams. He's going to be a great leader. His brothers are going to serve him, right? His mother and father are going to bow down to him. When God gave him that dream, do you know what the Bible reports about Joseph? He had a little character problem. He was a bragger. Mm -hmm. He was a tattletale. It actually points out that he told on his brothers and got him in trouble, okay? So he definitely doesn't have the character for what God's called him to do. So God gives this promise through two dreams, awakens Joseph's destiny, and what's the next thing that happens? The process begins. He is sold into slavery. First of all, he goes into a pit, which I love to say is preachers in training as the last lessons. But anyway, then he's sold as a slave. Now, these are his own brothers that have done this, okay? When you're sold as a slave back then, you're going to be a slave the rest of your life. Your wife's going to be a slave. Your kids are going to be a slave. I mean, they basically, it would have been probably kinder if they would have killed him. That's how serious. When you're the heir of a wealthy man, Jacob, his father's Jacob, Israel, and now you're sold as a slave. Wow. His whole, he thinks his, my whole destiny's been changed, right? So he's thinking, God will come through. He'll show my dad what a jerk my brothers have been. But one year of slavery, two years, three years, four years, five, ten years of slavery, no word from home. So now he's still obeying God. Remember I said we, we mature when we obey God in the midst of the desert. The wife gets the hots for him, right? Potiphar, he's a slave in Potiphar's house. She approaches him every single day, every day. But he keeps resisting, resisting. And finally, she grabs him by the robe. He says, no, he flees sexual immorality. He does exactly what God says. He gets the dungeon. 
Now, our prisons are country clubs compared to the dungeons, right? He's in this dungeon now. And boy, if there's a time he could have gotten better with God. Yeah, it, this is it. So I'm going to continue his story in a minute. But I want to go back to the when the promise is given. Because we, we need to backtrack here for just a second, okay? God gives us a promise. Here's the really important thing. Is that promise really from God? And I want to give you five things to look for in identifying is a promise from God, yeah. okay? First of all, <clears throat> does it line up with Scripture? Okay, if it's contrary to Scripture, throw the promise out. It's not from God. It's the enemy trying to puff you up, trying to get you out of the will of God. So in other words, God's not going to make you a promise of being married to somebody when you're married to somebody else. You got it? That's what I'm talking about. You can immediately go, that's ridiculous. That's the enemy. Get thee behind me. Handle the devil the way Jesus handled him. It is written. Okay? So speak the word of God. Number two, is this promise bigger than you? Okay? If you can accomplish this promise, it's not from God. That's good. The reason God will always make your promise that he makes for your life and your life calling bigger than your ability because if he didn't, then he'd have to share the glory with us. And he said, I'm not sharing my glory with anybody. So this is why God calls a guy whose worst subject in high school was English and creative writing. Hello, me, right? <laughs> worst subject. I scored 370 on the SAD, SAT in English. Choice, I really did. I'm not kidding, okay? So in all my travels, I've only met one person that scored lower than me on the SAT, and God says, right. And I'm like, what? You got the wrong boy, yeah. right? Uh-uh, and I did nothing for 10 months, and then two women came for me from two different states and said, if you don't write what God's giving you right, he's going to give a message to somebody else, and one day you're going to have to give an account for it. I would have missed my, de my destiny, yeah. right? So, you know, one day I'm sitting there going, whoa, you know, I know I can't write. Well, then, you know, there was another day I was trying to preach, and I put my wife to sleep, and I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> but um, here's the deal. What it did for me is it made me realize how I can't do anything without his grace, yeah. right. without his empowerment in my yeah. life, right. right? And that he made, because here I am tens of millions of books later, they're in 108 languages now, and people are always like, oh, you are such a great author. I'm like, uh-uh. The reason my name's on that book is I was the first guy to get to read it. Yeah. Good. You know, I realize, I realize that it was him who accomplished it through me. The dream was much bigger than my ability. Number three, does the fulfillment of this dream benefit only you or does it benefit others? If it benefits only you, you better check into it a little closer. All right? If you look at the prophet Nathan comes to David in 2 Samuel, this is amazing. He says, now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. This is amazing, right? But if you go to 2 Chronicles 14, you get a little interesting insight. And David went through a wilderness. Look at the humility of David. David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had greatly blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. So, you know, that's a... Because David went through this 14-year wilderness, he had that character. Yeah. So he realizes God did this for the sake of his people. So can I tell you, people are like, whoa, your books are in 108 languages, and they're in the tens of millions. I realize God did it for the sake of his people. Mm, that's good. That's good. Okay? I was just the donkey he chose to ride, it on, ride on. You see what I'm saying? David had an understanding of that. Number four, has your dream been confirmed by leadership? That's very important. Okay? Has leadership confirmed your dream? If you look at Acts 13, I'm sure Paul already knew this. Barnabas already knew this. But while the leaders of the church in Antioch were praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke through the leaders of that church and said, hey, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work I've called them to do. Yeah. So they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And the fifth one, has the dream or has what God has spoken to you, has it been repeated? You know, over and over, I remember God sending ministers I greatly respected, ministers who were greatly respected in the body of Christ at large to me when I was an engineering student at Purdue. John, you are called of God. Mm -hmm. 
over and over because my mother was a Catholic and she was very against me having anything to do with any kind of Bible studies, Christianity and all that. You were raised Catholic, baptized Catholic. So God's sending me these ministers that had international ministries saying, I don't know why you're, why you're at this university. One guy actually said that. What are you doing at this university, Purdue University? You're called to the nations. And, 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 and you know, the guy who was helping me in my walk with God was standing right beside me, and he was laughing, and he said, he knows, he knows. But that guy also knew that God had a lot of character development to do in me because I was far from ready. Okay, and here's the thing. You always are going to think you're ready before you're ready. So just get ready for that, okay? Okay, I'll tell you more about that when I tell my personal testimonies. And, but let me say this. A promise will inevitably usher you into a new season. So what happens with Joseph? He gets that dream. Bam, he's now in a pit. He's a slave. So he has gone into a season of wilderness. It's very important that we understand that. A promise will keep you on course. This is so important until you reach your destiny. If you look at, um, at Luke chapter 1, verse 37, no word or promise from God shall be without power or impossible for, for fulfillment. When God speaks a word, it's got all the power in it you need to fulfill that promise if you just stay in line with that promise. Yeah. Number two, God says, I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. That's when he spoke to Jeremiah when he was a 16-year-old boy. And I'm sure Jeremiah, and the Bible doesn't record his wilderness, went through a lot of wildernesses before he started bringing the word of the Lord to Israel, yeah. right? Or Judah, or, or it, was, it was Judah, yes. All right, let's return back to Joseph, all right? If you look at Joseph, he's got this situation, right, where he's a slave for 10 years, dungeon for two years. He's going backwards from the promise, right? Because when you're put in a dungeon and you're a slave and you've been accused of race, raping one of the officers of the king's wife, you're in that dungeon to rot. They don't want to execute you because that's too easy. Yeah. They put you into the, these dungeons. I said our, our, our prisons are country clubs. They are. I've been in a Middle Eastern dungeon. They're usually emptied out cisterns below the ground. They're damp. Their ceiling's only about four feet high. Okay, they're horrible horrible places. They would give what is known as the bread of, and water of affliction. They give you just enough bread to keep you alive, just enough water to keep you alive because they want you to suffer. Yeah. That's where Joseph is. Now watch what happens here. We're going to go to Psalm 105 and this, is, this has to be one of my favorite scriptures in the Old Testament. He sent a man before them. So you remember Joseph said the same thing to his brothers. You didn't send me here. God sent me here. Yeah, exactly. Okay? That's amazing when you think about it. Just like God led Jesus in the wilderness, God led Joseph to Egypt. But he knew how wicked his brothers were. They had a lack of character. And yeah. God says, I'm going to use their lack of character to fulfill my purpose in Joseph's training. Yeah, so God didn't make those brothers do it. He knew they would do it. Because God can't be tempted with evil, nor does he do evil, right? So look at this. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in iron. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you understand? He's not only in this damp dungeon that maybe has a four-foot ceiling. They're hurting him with fetters and irons. Okay, so get the picture here. This is not a country club prison like ours today, okay? Now look at this. Until, so he was put in those chains and fetters, the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Now I'm going to leave the scripture up because there's a lot in here that we don't see on the surface. We have to go to the original language. If you look at his word, it's the Hebrew word dabar, Okay, so here's what it means. It means spoken word or speech. So basically, it was Joseph's personal promise. Okay, okay, now let's go back to the scripture again. Until the time that his word, so can we put, until the time that Joseph's personal promise from God came to pass. Now look at this, the word of the Lord tested him. What is the word of the Lord there? It is a different Hebrew word, which means God's word. It's the, you know how Psalm 19, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the, right? You will see this word more often in Psalm 19 than any other place. It's the scripture that we have, the word of God. So the word of the Lord tested him. How did it test him? Can he still obey God in the midst of this hardship? Yeah, that's good. Okay, now look at this. Tested him, I love this. It is sarap, 
a verb meaning to refine. And this is what we're going into in the next lesson. You're getting a little preview right now. To test, this word describes the purifying process of a refiner who heats metal, takes away the dross, and is left with a pure substance, right? If you look at Joseph, he does not have the character to handle this position of authority. But when God's done with him after these 12 years and his brothers finally come back, He's not bitter. He doesn't say, oh, you guys created a hell on earth for me for 12 years. Yeah. I am sending you all to the dungeon. Let you taste this for the rest of your life. He doesn't do that. He's not bitter. He said, hey, guys, God sent you here to preserve our family. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you look at this, once his brothers came and stood to him, the Bible says this. I love this. Then Joseph remembered the dream which he had dreamed about them. Now, I want to make this really clear. That Hebrew word doesn't mean, you know how we say in English, oh, yeah. I remember that. I got a dream five years ago, right? That's not what that word means. That word remember means you keep in your mind the entire time. He put it. Let me show you how it's used in a different place. It says in Genesis 8.1, then God remembered Noah. God didn't go, oh my gosh, I just flooded the earth. I got a guy down there in a boat. My goodness, I'm going to do something about it. No, God kept in mind the whole time this is going on. Okay, so Joseph kept the whole time, he's a slave. The whole time he's in the dungeon, God made me a promise. My brothers are going to come down and bow before me, and they did. So you see that when you properly handle the promise, you fulfill your destiny, okay? So I just want to give you some counsel here. Number one, stay in the process and embrace it. James chapter 1, verse 4 says, so don't get out of anything prematurely. Let it the trials, do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. You've got to remember why, because God will fulfill what he has started. If you look at Philippians, I love this scripture out of the, this is the Passion Translation. I am fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you through your union with him and will complete it. God's going to finish it. In the meantime, you got to steward the process. How do we do that? Paul said to Timothy, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies, these are the personal promises that were made to him by God, previously made concerning you, that by them, by what? By the promises that God made, Joseph kept that promise in mind. I'm going to be a leader. My brothers are going to bow down to me. But you may wage the good warfare having faith and a good conscience. Man, there were so many times. I mean, when I got saved, you know, here I am, an engineer at Purdue University. I have a bachelor's in science and mechanical engineering, and I'm sitting there going, but I'm not called to be an engineer. God shows me you're called to ministry. Now I have a desire for ministry. And I thought in 1982 I had to start my preaching ministry because Jesus was coming back in 1988. (laughs) And let me tell you something, there was a lot of maturity process that had to go on in this boy for God to be able to entrust what he called me to do. Because why? God wants to protect us. He doesn't want what he called us to do to destroy us. And we'll talk more about this. So we saw the word refinement. That's what we're going into in the very next lesson.